Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another whistle kick episode of How to Fight. This time it's How to Fight Kurt Sloan, played by Jean Claude Van Damme in the classic Kickboxer. And of course, I'm joined by Andrew, but also past guest, episode 594, Dr. Gene Kanakogi. Thanks for coming back. Hey, thanks for having me back. Of this course, is fun. Of course. You know, it's funny when we, when Andrew and I started talking about this show in this format, we did one as a test and it went pretty well. And then we started brainstorming. And I said, you know who I think would be a ton of fun to have on to do this, but I don't know if she would do it is you. And then Andrew went and he sent me this email and I don't remember the exact text of the email, Andrew, but it was basically, oh my God, she's so in. Yeah, I, Gene, I will never forget getting your email when I sent it off to you. You're like, I would love to do this. I do it anyway when I watch TV, <laughs> how I would fight these people. So it was perfect. It's true because whether it be law enforcement shows that I'm screaming at the TV, mm. you know, most people yell at the TV during football and baseball games. I yell at the TV like, no, you cannot. If you step that way, you're going to get thrown or no, you're, you know, if you step, <laughs> it, you can't go in that door. And who goes into a scary house and says, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm constantly yelling at the TV. So when you guys invited me to do this, I said, wow, this is fun. We've had a really good time with it. The audience likes it. And, you know, based on the feedback, we're doing a pretty good job. I, I, I haven't received any, you know, death threats. Andrew? No, death no threats? Not, okay. not yet. Not okay. yet. So we should be good. We should, we should be good. Uh, of course, I think this is, would you say, I'm curious what both of you think. Would you say this is Van Damme's seminal role or is it Bloodsport? I think this is what gave Van Damme even more of his stardom. Uh, yeah. I think, I think his, uh, as we speak, but I think his signature split was felt around the world. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so I think yeah. this, this defined, it definitely did not, did not define his acting skills, but I love the cinematography of going back and forth when he was really, really slender to being super built um, mm. in the same shot. So it, it, but it, but it highlighted a lot of his martial arts skills. I mean, the stuff that he exhibited, um, a lot of it, you just can't learn overnight. And then of course, you know, the camera action, kicking somebody, slapping somebody across the face with your foot, probably not easy to do uh, with one leg. Mm. Yeah, I, I I don't know that this was his seminal role. For me, I think it was Bloodsport, which he made before he made Kickboxer. Bloodsport right. came out first. Um, By about a year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, re, it was like the next movie he did, for sure. Yeah. Um, f uh, and and he did the split in both of them, right? I mean, that's his sure. thing. It's like he's, he's got to show that in every movie he does, whether it's Bloodsport, Kickboxer, Cyborg. It doesn't matter. Like, all they all had it. He's got to do a split. Um, he's got to try to show his butt. Oh yeah. He did a great job of that in this one. You know, anybody, you know, not a lot of people can pull off a loincloth. He did all right. He, he did all right. <laughs> well, since we're going there, um, everybody thought I, when I, I remember when I was a kid watching this, what a handsome guy, like he was just so handsome, very brooding and uh, very, rightful you know he mm. he stood up for the girl and the damsel in distress he wasn't handsy like his um like his 80s looking brother so uh his he wasn't articulate but not we don't look at these movies to see a fine actor we look mm. at these movies for his martial arts uh so this and all his other movies this is what really gave van damme his name that it's it's such a recognizable name even years later. Sure, sure. And and the split is so iconic. There was the, what was the truck commercial? I think that was at the oh, Super yes. Bowl a few years yep. ago. Yep. Um, and a lot of people don't know that the character of Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat video games was modeled on Van Damme. He, oh, has, um, he has a movement, one of, one of the character's movements is literally to drop into a split and punch in the groin. Where does that come from? It comes from this film. Yeah. So how many guys do you think? Yep. Oh, did he do in Bloodsport? Yep. 
Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah, it was an uppercut. It's, it's an uppercut. In this one, it's a straight punch. If I remember in the game, it's a straight punch. So how many guys do you think in the 90s tried this split and are still hurting? <laughs> um, well, I one of my friends in high school definitely was spending time doing splits and splits on chairs. And it was 100% a response to these films. And I can tell you in our dojo, probably in response to these films, uh, I think my parents watched it. Uh, and all of a sudden we're stretching and uh, we're sitting down and you have your partner sitting in front of you with your, le your legs are spread and your partner's in front of you with their heels into your inner part of your knee, pulling you forward and pretty much trying to do what they did in the movie. Uh, and I, I couldn't understand. I understand to be limber in judo, but I think the split was probably the influence for that training technique where I didn't see the benefit of it, but um, I prided myself where I could get close, but not mm. there. Now it wouldn't be the split. Now it would be the stuck because I'd be stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I watched the movie and I, I get, I feel pain just watching it when he does it. So well, you should, because <laughs> there, there's something very instinctive in how, how awful a training methodology that is. <laughs> You know, uh, don't tie your feet to ropes and pulleys and crank your legs in the hope that it's going to work out because it's not. You know, the training methodology has evolved so much over the years. Uh, bang your head against the wall to make your forehead stronger was probably something that people did. And even when I was training on, on the judo team, years and years ago our training methodologies are nothing now everything is so scientific mm. but back then it was just so organic well try it you know if it hurts or if you have your shoulder pops out you don't need emts your sensei just pops it right back in and there there was a um an element of this is what we've always done traditional training is better and if it hurts it's probably doing the right thing that's true. No pain, no gain. Right. Now it's almost no pain, no brain, because, right. you know, if, if something hurts, you know, there's a difference between uncomfortable and hurt. So if something is uncomfortable, you, you can push through it. You can, you know, it's uncomfortable for me to do a, um, a burpee. It's mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. I almost say I'm allergic to doing burpees, <laughs> but you push through it. It doesn't hurt. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. But if you're in an arm lock and you're trying to tap out because it truly hurts and you're going to have your arm broken, that's the next step. That's what you do. That hurts. Right. Right. Okay. Is there anything about the movie that we should point out? Anything fun, any trivia, any memories, anything like that, that we should go? Andrew, you often have trivia stuff you want to throw in. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I didn't realize this until I rewatched it because at the time it wasn't something. I, when I watched this when I was in high school, I was watching it for Van Damme. Mm. But the gentleman that played his brother is a legit undisputed heavyweight kickboxing champion. Yeah, I saw oh, that. Wow. Which I didn't realize until I rewatched it and kind of looked up some things. My wife was like, he moves really good. Is he a real martial artist? And I said, I don't know. Let me look. And, you know, Dennis Alexio was a legit kickboxing champion yeah uh, uh the couple things that i i found in there that were interesting van damme did the choreography yep which explains a lot because there there were a lot of there was a lot of kung fu in the montages and a lot of shotokan in the montages that, I mean, I, I haven't trained in Muay Thai, so I can't say definitively it wasn't, but I don't think it was. No, it seems to be a, um, I guess, a, a cornucopia or, or just such a mix of martial arts. I think there may have been one or two judo throws, if I can recall. Yeah. Uh, when, when he was fighting the, um, the bullies at the uh, local grocery store or at the bar after he was uh, dancing. So I think there were a couple of judo throws incorporated in there as well. So I, I, there was everything. There was every martial art that you could think of, and which is good for the viewer, no matter what time period, because you want to see a little bit of everything. Mm. 
you know, if, if we did just judo in a fight scene, it wouldn't be as dramatic. But if you've got some kicks and punches and, and some acrobatics, and then you, you solidify it with a judo throw. I think in some of the other movies like Fast and Furious, I think um, Ronda Rousey f did something and then she followed it with a judo throw and bam, there was the yeah. drama. So you have to be able to incorporate a lot of techniques like, like Van Damme did. And I think it was great choreography. Yeah, the, the, only, the only thing you said, Gene, that I would uh, disagree with was you mentioned he was dancing in the bar and I don't know that you could call what he was doing, dancing. Gyrating? Uh, those two girls were into it yeah but they were being they were actors they were being paid to get into it That's yeah well <laughs> you know I, I that could be for the time era i mean he yeah. could have been wearing you know i guess like z cavarici pants or something or or his uh, parachute pants um, or New York, the Frigno gym pants, because that's how the guys were dancing pretty much in that time period. So if that was dancing, then maybe that, yeah, it certainly wasn't Patrick Swayze. If, if we're going to talk about his attire, can we please mention his somehow combination tank top overalls? I thought he was trying out for Shana. -na. Holy cow. They had like adjustable <laughs> metal buckles like what was how do you even find that I, I was gonna say he was incredibly well dressed for his position like he was the corner man for his brother wearing a dress shirt and dress pants I have never in my life seen a corner man at any fight wear anything remotely close to no. that and anytime he was out and about he was always dressed really really nice it's a great point. that's true he was dressed very nice, except like Jeremy said, that tank top that I thought he was he was trying out. It should have been Gold LeMay. And he and if he had a microphone <laughs> in his hand. And that's the whole thing. I mean, you if you dress like that, no matter what time period, you really need to know how to fight. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's well said. All right. So let's let's move on to that part. Let's talk about the how to fight part. We get, when, when is it? It's uh, six minutes in, 640 or so in. We actually see him move for the first time. They're in the park and his brothers got him holding pads and they're, they're doing some stuff there. Um, you know, let's, Gene, take it from, from there. Move forward as, as far, bounce, bounce around if you want. What were we seeing that made you say, ah, here's an opportunity or here's something I want to stay away from? You know, one of the things that I saw is how wrong his brother was in giving him the instruction. When they were in the park, his brother said each, was, was telling him each kick had to be the hardest kick ever. And your explosive power, you want to save that explosive power for the timing, for when you're doing it right. Uh, you train, you fight how you train. That's absolutely for sure. And you train how you fight. But you're also sparring and you have to, when you're engaging in just sparring and practicing, you certainly don't want to hurt your, your person because what they're doing in, just like in judo, it's the mutual benefit for all. Mm -hmm. So in judo, we actually thank our opponent for helping us to become stronger and better. Uh, I think what the brother was exhibiting was almost like bully-like features and Van Damme, what he maybe have have been conveying is no this isn't how it's done you have to have a more subtle approach and then when it's right to strike so the brother clearly got frustrated with him uh in the park in that area or maybe the brother just wanted to keep showing off and, and maintaining uh his position of dominance sure yeah i the things i noticed is that uh which i which surprised me a little bit is it seemed like when i was watching his stances were super open like you know wallace fights with a very side stance right mm -hmm. very very narrow and his stance seemed almost head-on kind of like uh, and maybe not his upper body so much but his lower body was a lot more open and forward front facing than i thought it would have been uh certainly i didn't remember it being like that and i was like that's definitely something that could be exploited a little bit that i don't i don't think he's gonna have the same mobility uh because it was so wide mm. front facing um you know obviously super flexible we've already talked about that uh and the other thing i wrote down i wrote it down 
the jump spin kick is his jam. Like that is he loves that thing. Stay out of the way of that foot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with the front facing, it's interesting because we, we talk about how you derive power. So if you're bladed and given uh, the fact that I'm in law enforcement, the first thing our instinctual when, when we see in, in movies is that we want to shoot bladed because we don't want to give the biggest target. Hmm. We want it, we want to cant our body, cant our arms. And then I learned in the academy, the, the weaver stance where you're actually front facing, where you have the most power. And even though you're exhibiting a larger target, you have more power and uh, you're more protected because your, your vest is clearly facing mm. forward, but that's where your power is derived. So mm. if, you, if you blade too much, you're not going to be able to have that power, even if you want to come, come follow up with that kick that has to start front facing so that you can start uh, gathering your power to be able to give and execute each technique. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you look at any sport, there is some version of, you know, what in, in a lot of traditional martial arts we think of as kind of like a ready stance, fudadashi kind of a thing. How do sprinters start? You know, their blocks. Yeah. They're, they're down, but when they stand up, it's a bent over. They're loading up their hamstrings in a similar stance. They're facing forward. Football players, pretty much any time you have power, you need both both feet pointing where you need to go. Uh, the example of, of Bill Wallace and being successful is um, is an anomaly, and you know he made it work due to circumstance. But he also there's an important element there in that uh, the initiation of motion. Every time he throws something, something has to initiate that motion to generate the power. And it's, you know, it's, it's right on my certificate. Um, how, how does it go? In speed, one can develop power, not necessarily in power can one develop speed. Mm. You know, this idea okay. that if, if, you if you watch him, it was very much Van Damme, you know, kind of at the beginning, brr, you know, flipping that foot around. And so, you know, that strategy at least is in good company. Yeah. There were a lot of strategies that were used, um, talk, you know, talking about the front facing, because one of the things that I noticed that Van Damme did is he squared off a lot and he squared off and, and he got his muscles revved up, kind of like what you were saying, you know, you're loading up the hamstrings. He, it looks like he got his posture and his position. Uh, it, it almost made me look like, uh, made me think of just like prelude to the karate kid you know, just getting in that position, mm. gearing up, getting your mindset, because your mind is really what's driving your body. Sure. And, and of course, you're, you know, with the, with the um, spinning kicks, I mean, it's just where your head goes and where your feet are facing is the direction where you're going. So it all, he, he pulled it all together. He did. It's just that uh, the outfits and, and the, um, and the dialogue <laughs> were, were entertaining at the least, but the martial arts part was fun. Yeah, Gene, you mentioned squaring off against someone, which, you know, we're, we're talking right now of like the direction of our body being square. But the other thing I found interesting, uh, and this certainly is not the only movie he's done this in, but he has a habit of being okay. I'll kick you and then you kick me and then I'll kick you the same way and you kick me and then I'll kick you and then you'll kick me and I'll kick you and you'll kick me. And His aversion same. to blocking makes me ill. Yeah, and and if if I if he got into that situation with me, I wouldn't give him the exact same kick every time because he's going to think that's what's coming. I would change it up. If he's, if we're going to get into that trading back and forth, it's not going to be a kick coming one of those times. It's going to be something else. Yeah. His aversion to blocking and his, it's almost like he, a choreography where he likes to dance. He likes to do mm. a kick dance and maybe it's for the dramatics because taking the kick versus blocking the kick and, and letting the viewers see it follow through. But there are so many people that watch these and try to emulate what they see, um, as we mentioned earlier with the split. So putting up the blocks uh, would send a, a better message saying, hey, you know, you don't need to get kicked each time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also doing the kick for kick, unless it's a prearranged, pre-agreed fight, and clearly it's a movie, 
Uh, you're absolutely right, Andrew, changing it up. You know, we have combination techniques in judo. You have to change it up. In boxing, they have those combination techniques. You totally have to change it up. Otherwise, it's going to be two people just sitting there slapping the daylights out of each other. Yeah. One of the things that we didn't see much of, which I think if this movie was to be remade, we would see far more of, it was leg kicks. What's that? It was remade. Sort of. Sort I didn't of. see not, the remake. It's not the same plot. Okay. It's not the same plot. But we didn't see much in the way of leg kicks. I think Tong Po does like one in the final fight at the beginning, if I remember correctly. And we know from kicking the palm tree that his legs are not naturally uh, of the caliber that kicking a palm tree is is going to be okay. So that suggests to me that he'd probably be susceptible to leg kicks. So I think that's the first thing that I would put in, in my column of, you know, stuff that I would want to train to address if I was going to fight him. Especially leg kicks. I mean, well, his kicks are so powerful. So if you take the legs yeah. out, you can defeat somebody that powerful and you know kicking like if you kick in the common peroneal the side of the leg you hit that nerve you're going to collapse that leg mm. you get a great shot and the other thing is when you do a leg kick and, and i agree they, they did miss a lot of them uh it's not as pretty obviously as um as the higher kicks but they're so effective not, not only can you at least kick to stun but you can kick but it, it's it doesn't open you up your, sure. your leg's not all up there. It's, it's harder to grab a leg kick. And if you miss the common peroneal or if you miss the quadricep area, the, the large kicking area, and you happen to hit the side of something else, well, either way, it's going to, ta it's going to take the tree down. Yeah. Yeah. The, I noticed that as well. And I also wrote down as much as he may have trained elbows, he only used, I think I counted, two elbows in the entire fight that mm. every single every single one of his attacks was what i would call a ranged attack right he used the far extremity that he could he never had anyone really right up in close to utilize any any sort of close combat so i think that mm. is another thing that he may have you know kurt sloan may have a bit of a weakness with any sort of in close grappling fighting well, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeremy. I, I wanted to point out he has a hard time with anything when he's not angry. Until mm. he got upset in any circumstance, he was useless. It was almost this like Hulk conversion, like, ah, now I'm going to actually care and fight back. And you see it, like you see it in the bar not one of those people actually attacked him. He's like drunk and he's just like, uh, uh, and throwing, and they just, they just run up to him, you know, and it felt like the first level of a video game. Like you're trying you know, to figure out the buttons. <laughs> true. And the other thing, Andrew, with the elbows, uh, I got the appearance. I felt that Tong Po was very tall. He, he looked very tall. Yes. Uh, Van Damme, by his features, you can tell that he's not as tall. So if he was using elbows, it would have probably, even if he got up close, um, his elbow strikes would have not been in the immediate soft tissue region of like the neck or the face because he probably wouldn't have been able to reach. Although it would have been in the lower region where it would probably have been very effective. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people would want to see him elbowing Tong Po in the, in the groin um, and using close quarter strikes mm. to the groin area. Um, so maybe that's why he didn't use so many elbows, just because of the height disparity. Yeah. yeah. One of the patterns I saw throughout was he's hanging those kicks out there. You know, the aesthetic of that high kick, demonstrating the flexibility, and the whole time I'm kind of, you know, screaming at the movie, pull your damn kicks back. And then we see in the final fight that Tong Po starts grabbing his leg because he's hanging the foot out there. And, you know, it was one of the things that I remember as, as a kid, as I was coming up, 
I would hang my kicks out there because I wanted them to look good. And then I would spar with people and they'd grab my leg. It's like, don't grab my leg. And they're like, don't leave your foot out there. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. That's gotta be for the aesthetic part. You know, also when you do throw a kick or a punch, uh, as you know, the impact, it will reverberate a little bit longer, the more you maintain that contact. So if you throw a punch and you, and you just throw a punch that it's kind of a jab tap retreat, it's not going to have as much impact. But if you do throw a serious punch and you let it stay there for just another split second, that energy will transfer and it will have a larger impact. Mm. But now with that said, he left his kicks out there, not for the impact. They were kind of not in contact any longer, if I recall. So this may have been just for showmanship, but from what I understand and from me teaching strikes, sometimes you have to leave it out there. And that's what my dad taught me. You leave it out there on in full contact, but also be mindful that because your limb is out there, somebody can grab it. Sure. Yeah. I, I think the difference though is leaving leaving something in contact for a second and pulling it back or leaving something there for five seconds six seconds, seven seconds. Okay, now I'm done. Uh, the other thing I noticed, Jeremy, you know, you mentioned the the leaving something out there, but on the same vein on the other side, that final fight, there was a whole lot of grabbing and like looking at the audience like, hey, I'm going to punch the guy. Like, um, yeah. why didn't you punch him immediately? Like, you're, you, you realize you're in a fight, right? There was a lot of that. For sure. I think the reality of the 90s movies added so much drama. I mean, if you think about all the other movies that were out around then, you needed that drama and almost like you wanted to carry that person around and be like, I'm going to throw him, I'm going to throw him and I'm throwing him. You know, it's almost like, what was it? Like the, the, the wrestling where you just carry somebody around and twirl them three times and then throw them. So grabbing somebody and looking at the audience for drama, and of course the person who is going to receive the hit is also standing there like, oh boy, I guess I'm going to get hit. In that (laughs) time period, you know, there is something called an escape. (laughs) Yep. You know, that's a good point. I wonder, you know, and, and Andrew, we might be able to do an episode on this, the influence of professional wrestling on fight choreography. Because in the early days, cameras weren't fast. They couldn't capture people at full speed. They had to slow things down. They had to make it work with that. And as the technology got better, how much had just stylistically that fight choreography kind of lagged behind? And how do you fill time with drama when you do dramatic things like carry people around, like look out at the audience and I'm going to punch him. I I don't think that if you, during competition in the past, you, you guys before you kick somebody or executed a technique, I don't think you looked at the audience. Um, I can tell you in, a, in the dynamic of a judo fight, I have never, I never looked at the audience, only at my mom when she was coaching me a couple of times, just to see what the heck she was saying and, and um, whatever strategy she was doing. But it wasn't mid fight. It was maybe when I was fixing my gi and going back to the starting point. Uh, never have I ever, gone to execute a throw, get somebody where I'm in, have them in throwing position, look at the audience, (laughs) almost point to my opponent and then throw them. It's either you do it or you're going to get countered. Yeah. Maybe something to, to aspire to. (laughs) Kind of like, kind of like Babe Ruth calling the home run, you know, you know, set up, grab the belt, point, flip. I I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. If you can pull that off, it would be probably make sports center true you know that I'll, I'll contact the current olympians and see if um if they can do that at the next world championships if they wouldn't mind before they're executing a throw or you know and, and see if they would just like kind of showboat a little bit yeah, yeah, and you know it, it's funny you just triggered a memory i the showboat there yeah. were these judo competitors there, there were local judo competitors and sometimes they would showboat a little especially when say it was a black belt fighting a white belt. Um, you kind of toy with them before the tournament, you know, during the competition. And, you know, the, it wasn't nice, but I've seen that, I've seen that happen. 
And the best is when you see the showboater uh, toying with that white belt in the competition and the white belt just picking that person up and slamming them mm. because that's the whole thing. When you showboat in any type of martial arts competition, it's so disrespectful uh, yeah. o- overall to your opponent, to yourself. So when you get picked up and slammed in which um, obviously for movie purposes, this didn't happen, but in reality, just seeing something like that, it kind of hits, strikes a chord to me saying, come on guys, if you want to make it a little bit more realistic, don't do this. Sure. Yeah. So, so I would be looking out for that. I would be looking to, you know, if he grabbed on and was like looking away, well, I'm going to be fighting back. That would have been part of my strategy for sure. So let's put some of this together. If you were to have, let's say you, you were, coaching you you know and you wanted to kind of give some note cards on you know here's what to watch for here's what to train for etc gene what's your summary of your fight strategy for fighting kurt sloan my summary would be uh, um know how his fighting style was so for instance perfect example he leaves his his leg up in the air Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to grab that leg and I'm going to throw Mochi Gary, which is an inner leg sweep because he's going down. And being that he is one of those people that likes to execute something and then freeze and hold it there, I'm hoping he would throw a punch at me. I would get out of the way of the punch and then his arm would be fully extended and I would sit myself right into a nice arm bar. Mm. So that's one way I would do it. I would also, aside from knowing his fighting style, I would visualize me doing those techniques that I just told you. Uh, I would visualize his leg kick coming up to my ear and shoulder and doing a block, something that he has aversion to, doing a block, grabbing it, stepping out of the way and throwing him with a foot sweep, taking him Mm. in a circular motion and getting him down. Uh, He doesn't seem like he has amazing skills on the ground. So wrapping myself around him like a shawl and choking him would be an easy target. His neck actually doesn't look as well developed and didn't look as strong. All his muscle were in his, uh, uh, in his shoulders and in his arms. And there were a couple of scenes where he had 19 inch biceps back down to 14 inch biceps back up to 19 inch biceps. So you realize that although he has that flexibility, my, my training would be to really visualize and know where his vulnerabilities were. I would not do kick for kick, punch for punch with him because his training is clearly where he's masterful. So I would have to work my way around it and use the skills that I find to be my skill strengths, mm. which happens not to be his, uh, and also a knee to the common peroneal in the side of his leg to bring him down would be something that he wouldn't expect because it's not what he would train to do. Right. Wow. Well said, Andrew. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, Gene mentioned one of the things I did, which it it's hard not to mention this every time we do a movie because every movie we have done, um, whether it's Perfect Weapon, uh, Roadhouse, and then Above the Law, the the people we're talking about don't really have a ground game in the mm. movie. The the actors may absolutely have right. that, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the character. Correct. And un, until we do a movie with some serious grappling, everyone's strategy could easily be just get in there and take them down because they're probably not used to that. Now, the question is, how do we do that? You know, Gene's idea of catching something to sweep them out to God would absolutely be a good one for me i'm gonna be looking for his jump spin kick and i'm gonna stuff it i'm gonna as soon as i see it coming in i'm i'm rushing right in because if i can catch him mid kick i'm behind him and gene already mentioned he doesn't have a whole lot of neck strength by the looks of it so if i'm behind him i can easily go in for a rear naked choke there you go that's a very good strategy I, if I had better skills with my throws, I would be looking for those techniques hanging out, especially the punch, but I don't. So I can't, I can't play that way. I think I'm looking at leg kicks and I'm looking to be as nice to him as possible because I feel like if I can keep him from getting emotionally involved, Mm. 
he doesn't tap into that top, what, 30, 40% of his capacity, you know? So I'd hit him and then I'd apologize. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I really like I love- your hair. Um, I hope you end up with Miley, right? Like just really like, just be super nice to him while I'm kicking him in the leg and hope that he's just like, oh, it's fine. Ugh. You know, and then eventually when his, one of his legs doesn't work, you know, then kind of go in for the kill, which could be just about anything at that point. You know, that's a great strategy, you know, men- mental ability in martial arts and mental toughness and the mental game is so important important, not just the physical game, but I'm going to bounce back to what Andrew said. Andrew, I just have to tell you, if you go in behind him for a rear naked choke, just hope that he's not drinking whatever he was drinking, because then he's going to end up dancing with you. (laughs) Again, though, again, is it dancing? (laughs) (laughs) And, And what Andrew said, you know, it is a mind game because he did not activate his anger until he found out what happened to Miley. So uh the that's the worst thing a fighter can do is fight with emotion right you go in there you have to use your skill set any de- even decisions you can you cannot make good decisions when you're chock full of emotion right and miley knew that she didn't want him to know she wanted him to be good level-headed point. but let's face it if he hadn't gotten angry he, he would have got his butt kicked i mean he was getting his butt kicked yeah that's true. That's true. And, you know, as from a female perspective, bouncing to Miley, if she had an uncle with that crazy skill set, why did she not get trained? You know, maybe this was a little bit way before the thought of Mulan and, of course, Rusty Kanakogi. But uh, <laughs> she, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm sitting here saying, why is she going to pull out some mad skill set? You know, is, is that going to happen? If I had an uncle with, with, you know, crazy Miyagi skills like that, I mean, actually, I had a, I have a dad with those skills, and it's amazing what my dad, who is very gentle, and I do go to the grocery store for him, and uh, you know, as long as this guy has has food, he's happy, and he has trained me in so many disciplines with such an even head mm-hmm. and and an even temperament. But then there's that snap, that power, and uh, I, it just bewilders me why Miley didn't train with her uncle yeah and and what would have happened would jen have even really cared if they hadn't stabbed his dog yeah that's true i mean that really that seemed to bother him everything else was like eh, you know i'll throw coconuts at you that's cool <laughs> that's true well, well nobody likes a hurt animal and oh no i had a, i actually had a hard time with that scene it was like, my oh, wife okay. did my wife did as well yeah yeah. So yeah, me too. I, I, who, whoever could do that to an animal, just they, they need to get slapped across the face a few times with Van Damme's foot. <laughs> While holding, holding a knife. While holding a knife, yes. If that's somehow possible. So is there anything else that we, we need to unpack with this? I mean, these are pretty simple strategies, but then again, he was a pretty simple fighter. Very yeah, simple. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. No, no, Gene, please go ahead. Very simple fighter, but I like how he trained. Mm. And it it fell in line with kind of that, uh, I think about, you know, Rocky in the eye of the tiger. I think of when Miyagi was training Daniel-san. And every, it seems like all of this training, you know, the intense training, the kicking, kicking of the tree. Uh, to break the tree. I mean, the above and beyond, you know, Rocky running in Siberia in in the snow. Uh, I think all that training, that was kind of where the movie really just started pulling you in to see how hungry he was for the win, how hungry he he was for the win. The problem is it was for a vendetta. And again, based on emotion, but we all saw how emotion driven van damme is in this movie or his character is so going to fight somebody for revenge that's not a great because it's it's so emotionally tied but the training showed his investment so it kind of flip-flopped a little bit like oh dismiss it because it's emotion but the willingness to go through whatever the uh the uncle put him through to do that training 
Yeah. I think the training montage is such a classic, iconic feature of, of so many great martial art movies. You know, uh, Rocky, you mentioned, you know, the Karate Kid, Best of the Best. They all had great training montages, you know? And so that's what makes them all, every single one of them, great movies, you know? I, I think the montage is the most relatable part, honestly. Yeah. You think about, you know, I'm not going to fight Tong Po or anybody like him. I'm not going to be at the All Valley karate championships but when you see those training montages i've done those things oh i know that kata you know stuff like that and i think yeah. that for a lot of us that's that's the resonant part that's the part yeah. where we see ourselves in the film and there were two specific training things that i wanted to to point out which i thought was interesting one is putting pads on the end of sticks and using them mm. you know 32 years later my dojo did the exact same thing because we couldn't be next to each other because right. of covid like i, I, I saw that same thing. and and was like oh my gosh that's like we did that exact same thing last year which i thought was interesting and the other part that i thought was really interesting and you know maybe a, a little teaser of something to come in a future episode uh but that he brought him to a bar and essentially taught him how to fight confused and impaired. Yes. That's an, that's an, something that we don't often talk about. When I was training in our dojo, my father found it important to blindfold me. Mm. And uh, I wasn't impaired, but I also was very out of sorts because I didn't have my sight. And I was blindfolded and I had to participate in Randuri. And uh, a couple of times I've tripped over my own foot, walked into the wall. I was very entertaining, but I also learned how to move. Both of my parents' senseis were blind. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, from Japan, both of mm -hmm. them. And it was so important for them to teach me how to be able to move without the use of my sight. Yeah. So, and then sometimes my dad would actually cover my ears as well with the blindfold. So to deprive me of those two sensor senses really taught me how to move. So I, I like the way you said that, Andrew. I mean, I would have preferred my folks getting me drunk in the dojo and then having me try to dance and move around, <laughs> but the blindfolding part. So I do really appreciate and identify with that. And I think a lot of athletes train in some level of sensory deprivation. Some people train with oxygen deprivation. Um, you know, so I, I do, that transcends over the years, through the years. Uh, that yeah. training uh, was fantastic how it emerged. And I could also tell you, I mean, from movies and, you know, we talked about how movies influence the viewers. My parents watched too many movies, in my opinion, because at one point, I think in Rocky, my mother had me pulling her on a bicycle. <laughs> um, it, it was uncomfortable for both. I wouldn't say it hurt. Uh, but it was rather uncomfortable for both. Uh, I still have some antiquated thing that my dad made me with weights and, and a bar to strengthen my, my hands and my forearms. And I still train with it, you know, 30, 40 years later. So where he got that from may have been like Zato Ichi, the blind swordsman from Japan. So <laughs> who knows? But the, cool. the, tra the training always gives you that inspiration to yeah. want to get up and fight, get up and work out and get up and do something, even with the, the 90s music behind it. Yeah. Or maybe the, sometimes the, because of the 90s music. The, the last thing I'll say is my wife enjoys watching these movies with me because, uh, you know, she she's not a uh, I don't think she would consider herself a martial artist, but she goes to a cardio kickboxing class for for, a, you know, and has for a number of years. And so she's enjoying this whole process of me sitting down and taking notes and and her, she always has an idea of what she would do. And because mm. her kickboxing class, they're just heavy bags standing up in the room. She would fight him, but only if he agrees to stand up straight like a heavy bag and just not move. That's, <laughs> that's how she would fight him. And look at the audience. <laughs> and just right. look at the audience, yeah. Right. Good stuff. I, I, I think that takes us, takes us through. Yeah. So, and if, if Van Dam wants to come on. Yeah, if he would like to, uh, come on the show as a rebuttal. Um, you know, Gene, I don't know if you would come back for that. I, I would only okay. if you wore his singlet. We'll <laughs> see. We'll see what we can do. Maybe, maybe we can work that out. 
Um, hopefully it would be a new one. I think that one has probably, uh, well, let's just say it's probably discolored by now. It's aged out. It's over aged time. Out. So, well, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. Thank you guys. This was a ton of fun and I hope to see you again real soon. Absolutely. Thank Andrew, you. Andrew, thanks. Thanks.